The girl was captured during my battle with Ling Cinder. She was one of her accomplices. The battle in which you failed to either eradicate or apprehend the cyborg? That is correct, my queen. As I thought. Go on. Unfortunately, our software technicians have had no success in tracking the Rampy and using the pod ship or the decom chip that I confiscated. Therefore, the primary purpose of this interrogation is to ascertain what information our prisoner might have that will be useful in our ongoing search for the cyborg. How long have you been a part of Ling Cinder's rebellion prior to your capture? I suggest you answer the question. I joined Cinder on the night your special operatives attacked. It was also the night you murdered my grandmother. You probably had no idea who my grandmother was. Who I am. Is it relevant to these proceedings? Oh yes. Incredibly relevant. Her name was Michelle Benoit. She served 28 years in European military as a pilot. She received a medal once for piloting a mission here to Luna for diplomatic discussions. Many years later, a man that she met on Luna showed up at her doorstep with a very interesting parcel. A little girl. Almost dead. But not quite. For years, my grandmother kept that little girl hidden. Kept her alive. And she ultimately paid for that with her life. It was the night I joined Lynn Cinder. That was the night I joined the side of the true queen of- Her tongue froze, her jaws and throat icing over. But her lips still managed a smug smile. She'd already said more than she thought Lavana would allow. And the fury in the queen's eyes made it worthwhile. I apologize for the prisoner's outburst, my queen. Would you like me to continue questioning her in private? That won't be necessary. You may continue with your questions, Sybil. However, I believe your prisoner may need some more motivation to stay focused on the answers we're interested in. I agree, your majesty. Scarlet gulped as a platform with a hatchet attached was wheeled in. Two guards dragged her onto the platform. She lifted her chin, trying to stifle her mounting fear. Tell me, where is Ling Cinder now? I don't know. Her own hand betrayed her, reaching for the hatchet's handle. Where is she? I don't know! You must have talked about the possibility of an emergency landing. A safe place to hide should you need to. Tell me. Speculate, if you must. Where would she have gone? I have no idea! <clears throat> Her hand slammed onto the top of the block. Perhaps an easier question then. Which finger do you value least? My queen. What? May I have her? She would make a lovely pet. You may have her when we are done with her. But then she'll be broken. They're never any fun when you give them to me broken. I said that you may have her, and you may. But what you don't seem to understand is that when a queen threatens repercussions against someone, she must follow through on those threats. If she does not, she's inviting anarchy to her doorstep. Do you want anarchy, princess? No, my queen. Precisely. Scarlet didn't have time to prepare herself before the hatchet dropped. On the Rampion, Dr. Erlen held a strange tool beside Thorn's face, sending a thin beam of light into his pupil. Hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Yes, I see. Mm -hmm. Would you stop mm hmming and tell me what's wrong with my eyes? Patience. The optic system is delicate, and an incorrect diagnosis could be catastrophic. Indeed. Severe optic nerve damage. Likely as a result of a traumatic head injury. Can you fix them? Of course I can. Great. Do it fast. I would need a proper lab to do that, Mr. Thorne. What? So you can't fix me? Not without a proper lab. At least now we know what's wrong, and that it can be fixed. We'll figure something out. Captain! Well, oh! Ha <laughs> ha! The escort droid body, now with Iko's personality chip, slammed into Thorn. I love it! I absolutely love it! It's the best present anyone has ever given me! And you're the best captain in the whole wide galaxy! Thank you, thank you, thank you! 
you! The android took to smothering his face in kisses, ignoring his struggles to peck away. Aiko, let him breathe. Right! Sorry. Aiko? In the flesh? How do I look? Whoops. <laughs> I mean, well, you'll just have to take my word for it that I am gorgeous. I'm glad you like her. But if you're here, who's running the ship? I switched the personality chips. Your escort droid didn't seem to care one way or another, as long as it best serves my master. Ugh. I also undid some of her programming. Hopefully she won't be feeling too concerned about lawbreaking after this. Just how I like my ships. Darla, are you up there? Ready to serve, Captain Thorne. For now, though, we have a lot to discuss. The royal wedding is in four days, and I think, I hope, that we're all in agreement that we cannot allow Levana to become the Commonwealth's Empress. Our plan before had been to interrupt the wedding and attempt to publicly dethrone her, but Dr. Erland has convinced me that that won't make a difference. It might keep her from being Empress for now, but as long as the people of Luna still call her their queen, she will continue to harass Earth however she can. So, I believe the only way for us to truly rid ourselves of Luvana is to go to Luna and persuade the people to rebel against her and crown a new monarch. And I think... If we can pull it off, I know of a way to get us up there, without being seen. All right, Miss Cryptic. What's the new plan, then? It starts with kidnapping the groom. That's the best idea I've ever heard. Count me in. We need supplies and wedding invitations and costumes, and we need to find a way to find Kai. He doesn't have a tracking ID. Why not use the Tankaro number? What's that? It's Emperor Kai's tracking number. The net profile shows up as a palace guard named Tankaru but it's just a foil. Really? Tracking now. Well, thanks, Cress. So here's what I had in mind. Cress, you're in charge of disabling the palace security system. Wolf, you'll cover her. Meanwhile, Aiko and I will track down Kai and get him to come back with us. We meet on the rooftops and Jason picks us up and flies us out. The only problem is I won't be able to sneak in as a guest. I'm too recognizable. So how do I get in without being noticed? What about... What about the escape tunnels? The ones that run beneath the palace in case of attack? None of the blueprints I've seen have anything about escape tunnels. They wouldn't be very safe if everyone knew about them. I don't suppose you remember where any of them go? Of course I do. Excellent. So, before we get into the details, are there any questions? How long before we're on Luna? A couple of weeks at least. Maybe as many as three. Doesn't New Beijing Palace have its own medical labs? Say, medical labs that might have, uh, <clears throat> magical blindness curing machines in them? You are not coming. It's too risky and you would just be in the way. Think about it, Cinder. When Crest takes out that security system, every guard in that palace is going to run to one of two places. To the security center to see what's going on, or to wherever their precious emperor is to make sure he's safe and sound. Unless there's another, even more obvious disturbance, far, far away from you guys. Say, in the medical labs? I have a question too. Let's say you manage to pull this off. Not that I really think you will. You do understand that once Levana realizes what you've done, she's not going to wait around to see what you do next, right? The ceasefire will be over. I do understand that. If we succeed, we'll be starting a war. The morning of the wedding, Cinder was a wreck of frazzled thoughts and skittish nerves, but at the center of it was a strange sense of calm. Either they would succeed today, or they would all become prisoners of Queen Lavana, or they'd be all dead. Cinder's stop was first, Adri's apartment, to get invitations. If you get the chance, give Adri a big kick in the rump for me. With the metal foot. <laughs> Cinder squared her shoulders as she neared the apartment working hard to keep her glamour of a palace official up. Then she knocked. Yes? G good morning. I is Ling Adri home? I am Ling Adri. Mm, a pleasure. Uh, I apologize for disturbing you at such an early hour. I'm a member of our royal planning committee. And as you are one of our distinguished civilian guests, I am honored to personally deliver your invitations for tonight's ceremony. She held out two disposable napkins that to Adri's eye were two finely crafted, well-pressed invitations. There must be some mistake. We received our invitations last week. 
How peculiar. Would you mind if I took a look at those invitations? So I can make sure some mishap hasn't occurred. Of course. Please come in. I must apologize for the heat. The air has been broken for a week now. I used to have a servant to assist with these things. A cyborg ward my husband took in, but, well, it doesn't matter now. Good riddance. Cinder's gaze traveled over the room. It hadn't changed much, but at the center of it all was an urn. Cinder's mouth went dry. My daughter, gone only recently, of letamosis. She was only forty. I'm sorry. Do you have children? No, um, no, I don't. I have one other daughter, seventeen years old. There was a time when all I could think of was finding her a nice, wealthy husband. But now I can't stand the thought of her leaving me too. But listen to me. Carrying on when you must have so many other places to be today. Here are the invitations we received. Interesting. Um, oh, these are the invitations for Ling Jung and his wife. Your addresses must have gotten switched in our database. How silly. Are you sure? When they arrived, I was certain. See for yourself. Goodness, so it is. I'll see myself out. Um... I don't mean to pry, but you mentioned a cyborg before. You wouldn't happen to be the guardian of Ling Cinder. I was, unfortunately. Thank the stars that's all behind us now. But she grew up here. I mean, didn't you ever feel that she could have been a part of your family? Didn't... Didn't you ever... Think of her as a daughter? You didn't know the girl. Always ungrateful, always thinking she was so much better than us because of her... additions. Cyborgs are like that, you know. So self-important. It was awful for us living with her. A cyborg and a Luna? Although we didn't know it until her mortifying spectacle at the ball. And now she's soiled our family name. I have to ask that you not judge us by her. I did all I could to help the girl, but she was unredeemable from the start. Cinder's fingers twitched, a familiar taste of rebellion. She ached to toss off her glamour, to yell and scream, to force Adri to see her, the real her, just once. Not the self-important, ungrateful little girl that Adri thought she was, but the orphan who had always wanted a family, who had only wanted to belong somewhere. But then a darker yearning climbed up her spine. She wanted Adri to be sorry. For how she treated Cinder like a piece of property. For how she taunted Cinder again and again for her inability to cry, her inability to love, her inability to ever be human. Before she could rein in the anger that roiled through her, she pressed every ounce of guilt and remorse and shame into her stepmother's thick skull, twisting her emotion so rashly that Adri stumbled, her side slamming into the wall. <gasps> but didn't you wonder... How hard it must have been. Didn't you ever feel guilt for the way she was treated? Didn't you ever think that maybe you could have loved her if you'd only taken the time to talk to her, to understand her? <sighs> sometimes, sometimes I do think that maybe she was misunderstood. She was so young when we adopted her. She must have been afraid. My darling Peony always seems so fond of her, and sometimes I think if things had been different with Garen and our finances that she could have belonged here. You understand. If only she had been normal. Normal. The word struck Cinder between her ribs. It made no difference. Adri could be filled with all the guilt in the world, but in her own mind, the blame would always be with Cinder. Because Cinder couldn't have just been normal. As soon as the door shut behind Cinder, horror crushed her, because what she had done to Adri... It was something Levana would have done. Chris gasped as the palace came into view. It was even more magnificent and imposing than she ever imagined. Wolf, with her on the hover, had his fierce eyes focused on the palace, but Cress could sense no amount of awe in him, only impatience. Maybe he was thinking about that girl, Scarlet. Cress was sad she hadn't met her. It was as if the crew of the Rampion was missing a vital piece, and Crest didn't understand how she fit. 
can I ask you a question? It's not about hacking security systems, is it? Of course not. Then fine. <sighs> this Scarlet. You're in love with her, aren't you? She's my alpha. Like the star? Uh, what star? Oh, um, in a constellation, the brightest star is called the Alpha. I thought maybe you meant like she's your brightest star? Yes, exactly like that. Then they disembarked the hover, produced their stolen invitations, and entered the palace. Meanwhile, in the escape tunnels, Cinder, Thorn, and Dr. Erlen were approaching the palace, right on schedule. They finally climbed the stairs up to the door, and she knocked the melody they had agreed upon. Aiko opened the door, beaming in the palace escort droid's outfit. Welcome to New Beijing Palace. 